Hey there, Jim Johnson for Accent Help here, and I'm making the tour of the vowels. We're continuing down the front to our final major front vowel that is very commonly used by English speakers, and that is the ah sound, the one that looks to me a little bit like you're on a, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, interstate and you're at a big clover leaf on the interstate driving around and you can never get off. So this is the a, ah, which is sort of like a simplified version of this symbol followed by the lowercase e, so this sort of typed a, and then this lowercase e, a simplified version is that one right there. Okay, so the a ah sound, the ash symbol, which is commonly called the trap vowel. Now, J.C. Wells is the one who came up with this lexical set of words, and there's another lexical set of words that is assigned to this for some speakers as well. That would be the bath set of words, B-A-T-H. Some people think of this as the ask list of words, and that is because we get some variations on that. I'll come back to that. Now, when we're talking about North American speakers, one of the things that super commonly occurs is that people call this, very commonly call it the flat A sound. Oh, he's got a really flat A. So what they mean is a word like, not as much on this word, but a word like trap. Trap starts to approach the E sound. This is very common for people, okay? It's not, I should say, it's not uncommon for many native English speakers, especially in, in the U.S. primarily. There's a little bit of a different thing that tends to happen in Canada. So the raising of this is common. It tends to raise for almost all American speakers when it's followed by an M or an N. So when you get something like man, man, the nasalization tends to raise this vowel even more, so it becomes man, man, man. You may almost feel like you get a little bit of an off glide. Man, oh man. And if you say something like um, uh, ram, like the ram on my computer or with the horns, so ram, ram, it starts to approach ram, rem, ram. Ram, maybe even seeming like it's rain. Eh, probably not all the way to rain, rain, ram, ram, that raising of it, which tends to go even further when you put an NG after it. And this happens for almost all Americans. So when you get to a word that would be sort of oftentimes sort of officially transcribed for generic speakers as like, angle or sang or rang, the nasalization tends to flatten that vowel even more that raises it up. In fact, probably raises it so much that it's more accurate to represent it as an e eh sound, the dress sound lowered. This is a diphthong or a, a diacritic for raising. This is a diacritic for lowering, showing how they're adjusting between each other. So that when it's something like angles, a lot of people think it's almost approaching, maybe even higher than this, towards a angle, angle, sang. So when it's got an NG after it, super common to raise it. For some other people, you will get that same kind of raising before a G, like uh, uh, Milwaukee. You may not hear a big difference between, can I have a bag for my bagel? A bag? for my bagel. So bag starts to approach bagel, big, big. So it starts to get really close to there with a G after it. Same thing with the NG for some speakers that it will go that far. Um, oh, this is the one that if you've seen Singing in the Rain, it's I can't stand it. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. That's part of what's going on is what people commonly call the flat A, okay? Now what tends, that, so that's the American tendency. What tends to happen for Canadians is that it actually lowers and starts to approach this, which is commonly in transcriptions in like phonetic dictionaries and things like that, tends to be used for the I and the OW diphthong, the price and the mouth diphthong which we'll talk about when we get to diphthongs as well. 
So this would be like what you might think of as a Southern saying for a word like price, where it's Southerners saying where they drop the second half, price. What's the price of that? Price, price. So that Canadians don't, it's not uncommon. In fact, I was recording someone in Vancouver and who had taken some linguistics classes and so was fascinated by the idea of, of those. And I brought up about, oh, it's interesting how pretty solidly across Canada, I'm hearing a lot of Canadians say, take the a ah towards this typed a and he said oh that doesn't happen here in vancouver so instead of saying van he said van vancouver that doesn't tend to happen here in vancouver so happen in vancouver happen in vancouver and he didn't realize it and he had actually was really geeking out on phonetics Okay, so that's one of the things that happens, especially a Canadian-esque thing. What tends to happen in England, especially, it also happens in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, is we will get some of the variations. So in these native English-speaking communities, we will get some of the variations that sort of reflect what we may think of as this British stereotype of the difference between trap and bath. So that Bath words that are on that lexical set from J.C. Wells make a shift towards, like for RP speakers, especially uh, sort of classic RP, all the way towards the ah sound like father, which we will come to in the future, so that we end up with trap, bath. Though for a lot of speakers, it's more like trap, bath, more approaching this, probably somewhere in between for most of those speakers. But in some other parts of England, so for example, very commonly with like a West, with, with a lot of the accents outside of the London, the greater London area, sort of the south of England, primarily southeast, because even in the southwest you get this shift. Most of the rest of England doesn't do that split between trap and bath, but a ton of them do move towards this so that it becomes trap and bath. So both of them move towards this, the same thing I was talking about Canadians very commonly doing. So that's one of the shifts that happens. This one is usually considered a short vowel because we don't tend to have any words that end with that that we commonly use. And it's also oftentimes considered a lax vowel. So Edith Skinner in her work, she was like, she kind of spoke of it as, I don't remember if she actually used these words, so welcome to my bias of remembering it, which is almost like it's an ugly sound. It was judged a little bit in that direction, and, and her text, which was leading people towards mid-Atlantic, transatlantic, was trying to, this, this uh, sort of old stage standard, what she called good American speech, like that's not judgmental, right? Um, she would tend to talk of this as a short vowel, I think partially to try to reduce it, to not have it heard as much. One of the issues to try to help people who have a tendency to raise it before an M or an N or an NG or before a G or something like that, is that you work on making this more of a tense vowel so that when you say ram, ran, rang, rag, the vowel is more structured in how it reaches the ah, which for a lot of people when we're working on that sound, it's about them feeling like it's a really wide sound. So there's a lot of variations that happen with the trap vowel. Some of you might think of it also as the bath vowel or the ask vowel, depending on what the accent is. So there can be a lot of variations in that in a ton of different accents. Very few languages contain this sound as well. So then you get shifts where people go to something usually, that same thing I've been bringing up over and over again, so that most ESL speakers, English as a second language, will say something more like trap, bath. So you get that shift similarly, largely because that vowel does not exist in their language. It doesn't exist in most languages. There you go. That one's a little more complicated. That's one of the more complicated ones. Certainly the most complicated when we're looking at the front vowels that we commonly associate with English speakers. There you go. 
For info about accents for actors, you can check out my website, accenthelp.com. Ah.